Hey there, welcome to the Happy Even After podcast. I am here with my friend today, Melissa Middlestat, and she is an expert at debt elimination budgeting and is the creator of the Financially Independent Program. After paying off $45,000 of debt, she now enjoys living debt free. She is also a certified sign language interpreter, and she knows the struggle of trying to make ends meet with a variable income. So she speaks honestly and openly about feeling hopeless at times because of crushing debt. With a degree in business administration, she is on a mission to help everyone find financial freedom. So welcome, Melissa. Thank you. Thanks for having me. This is such an important topic, and I feel like debt is like a big dirty secret word that no one wants to speak. Like no one talks about it. Girlfriends go out and they sit down and they talk about maybe their spouses or whatever is happening in their kids' lives, but they don't talk about debt, right? Yeah, it's definitely missing from the conversation, whether it's inside your family or with your gal pals. Um, Yeah, it's an embarrassing topic for some people. Other people think, oh, that's too private. I don't want to get into it, but it's definitely a missing piece of the conversation. And there's so much stress and anxiety around debt because if you have that kind of crushing debt, I'm sure it occupies so much of your time too, right? Yeah, that mental space. Mm -hmm. We all know the stressors that we take on and after all of the financial articles I've read, the psychology articles that I've read, money continues to be a number one stressor for Americans. And I can't even tell you for how many years in a row, you know, that's the case. And just that inability to talk about it, but then to have to experience it. And everybody experiences stress differently, but we all know that too much of it has impacts on our relationships on our health and to think that money can be one of the root causes that's that's doing that to our emotional health and to our physical health Um, yeah it's definitely a topic that we need to get out there in the open so that way people can can find some relief yeah and, and like you said there's so much shame around it you know, like you have this debt and you almost feel like a failure because of it. Like you couldn't figure your stuff out. And because of that, you have this debt. So can you share your own debt story with us? Yes, I would love to. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, there was definitely a time that I was very embarrassed uh, about the amount of debt that I had. I got my college degree, four-year degree, and then decided to go back to school to become a sign language interpreter. So that was an additional three years of college. And then after I graduated, I started, I got my first interpreting job. And if you think about teachers, they don't make very much money in the education system. Interpreters in the education system make even less. Mm -hmm. And so that was the first job I started on. and, And I poured my heart and soul going back to school to become a sign language interpreter. And, and so it was like, I was living my dream And then I got into the rhythm of spending money like I had it, right? I was (laughs) going out with buddies all the time. I was shopping. I um, took out a loan for a used vehicle. And then all of a sudden it just like, it felt like one day it hit me like a ton of bricks. You know, I, I was just, wait a minute, I am overspending from what I'm earning. And so then I just found my credit card debt increasing. I still had student loans that I was barely making a dent into. And so I would have these conversations with my colleagues and thankfully they're so kind, but I would, I would just be crying like, what are we supposed to do? And I got to this point where I just started interpreting. Do I have to leave the field? I was like, that was the only thing I could come up with was I'm not making enough money. I have to quit this job. But then to think about all the time and energy and effort that I'd put into getting my dream job, which now felt like a nightmare, you know? Mm. And so one of my colleagues one day was like, it's not the job, Melissa. It's you. (laughs) (laughs) And, And it, you know, 
having like hearing that feedback, yes, it was like, ouch. But at the same time, I was like, right. Like, what am I doing? You know, it's, it's my money spending habits. It's not the job. And so I was able to start digging into financial books and, and budgeting. And I set up a plan. I got myself on a budget. I operate under a zero budget and I can talk about that more later and what that means. But I started operating on a zero budget and I haven't stopped doing that. And that was in 2008. And so I had, you know, over $11,000 in credit card debt. I had my student loans. I had my vehicle that I had to pay for. Um, plus I had gotten engaged in the midst of all of this. And so there was a wedding to pay for. And um, within three years of kind of operating on a budget, I crushed $45,000 worth of debt. And we were able to save um, 15 to $20,000 to put toward our wedding. And it just, I, I'm debt free uh, because of that. And I couldn't be more grateful that that's how I get to live. And, you know, people will say, oh, your student loan debt, don't worry about that. That's considered good debt. And that's not true. Like anything that is hanging over your head and, and feels like it's controlling you, um, you know, I, I couldn't ever be able to classify that as good debt. And so getting okay. to that space. <laughs> so now the million dollar question is, how the heck did you do it? Yeah. yeah. Um, so by operating on a zero budget, I would take the amount of money that I was earning in that month and then all of my expenses. And I, some people like to budget using paper and pencil. Some people like to use an app. I am a strict Excel spreadsheet kind of gal. So that way I can manipulate formulas and it can do the, the subtraction for me. Um, so I would put it into an Excel spreadsheet. And mind you, I still have all of my Excel spreadsheets when I got my first new computer. So like 2012, I think. So from 2012, I still have all of them to this day. And I'd put how much money I was earning in the very top column. And then all of my expenses, I would line those down. And so let's say, you know, if I was earning $2,000 in that month, okay, my rent was 500. I'd take that out. I'd spend $500 on food that would come out. And then all the way down until the very last line where it showed zero, right? So then I knew my money had a place and that's exactly how much I had to spend for that month. And so if you know, I allotted $75 to going out to eat, then I would have that money in hand in cash. I was using only cash except for places that, that didn't accept cash, but I would keep it in these little envelopes. Mm -hmm. And then every time I would go to the grocery store, I'd have my grocery envelope with me and I would spend, you know, $50. I'd take that out in cash. And then I would know exactly how much I still had left to spend in that envelope for the rest of the month. And so it was just a way to see my money visually by keeping it in an envelope, but also a way to feel like I have control over that instead of my money just controlling me. I, I was over that business. So just by operating in that zero budget mindset and using the, um, using the envelopes, and then uh, Dave Ramsey teaches a topic called the debt snowball. And that's what I utilized uh, to get rid of my debt. And how you do that is you organize your debts from lowest to highest. And so that way, let's say you have a credit card with $100 on it, you can get rid of that and then apply that $100 toward the next debt. And the philosophy behind that is, there's a lot of people who will say, well, what about the high interest? I need to get rid of that first that's not the way to go about it. The way to go about it is to be able to start low. And then it, if you can imagine just like that snowball where it's like you start to gain more and more, and then it's just this effect where all of a sudden you're able to put, you know, 400, $500 toward your debt every single month. And then bam, you know, it just mm. it's being able to see that and feel that. Um, so so that, are, are you saying that you're not supposed to be paying down anything towards the bottom of that list and you're just starting in, in consolidating, putting everything towards the top and kind of ticking down? 
Right, exactly. So let's say if your credit card with $11,000 that I had, um, if that's the most, you obviously still need to pay the minimum on that because you don't want, um, you know, fees and that type of thing to add up. But you keep that down at the bottom until you can tick away everything else that you have. And that way, when you get to that $11,000, you're, you know, you're putting $400, $500 or more at it a month. And then it can go so much faster than it could if you're putting $50 toward this one and then $75 toward this one. You know, it's mm. just, it feels like a never ending chip if you don't focus on that snowball effect. Oh, that's so interesting. Now, yeah. is, is the envelope approach something you still do today? It, during COVID times, I can't, unfortunately, but when we're not during, you know, if, if we're not not going out, then yes, it's still something that I use. And I'll go to the bank once a month. I'll be able to see, okay, this is how much money I'm allotting in cash for the month. And then I'll bring it home and I'll stick it in my little envelopes. And the cashiers know when I'm coming in and, and I'll say, you know, oh, I need $300 in 50s and I need X amount in, in 20s. And so that's my ritual to go to the bank once a month and take out everything that I need. So if you go to a really nice dinner and kind of blow through that envelope and it's empty, that's it. You're done, right? Until the next month. That's it. You're done until the next month. Oh, so interesting. But I imagine that's, you know, that's hard to do, right? And what if there's your, your bills are more than your income? So if your bills are more than your income, so that's when you have to take a look at everything that you have in that expense category and say, okay, where can I make adjustments, right? So if you would normally um, pay for gas, like, you know, $200, okay, we'll figure out, well, where is that going? How can I put that toward other expenses? So you really just have to take an honest look at what you consider your expenses. Um, if you're in a situation where really the bare bones, your income doesn't even cover that, then that's a situation where you have to look for either a second job or financial assistance mm -hmm. somewhere. Um, but if that's not your situation, if you really do just need to take a look and tweak where you need to shift, um, that's what I run into with most individuals that I work with. They're like, oh, I, I didn't realize that I was spending $500, you know, going out to eat or whatever, mm -hmm. whatever it is. So that's just taking an honest look at, at, your, I call it inventorying your spending. Um, so that's the first step when I work with somebody is we inventory their spending so we can get an honest look at where the money's going. And so should someone be using a credit card during this time or is that kind of like off limits tucked hidden somewhere so you forget where it is? The latter is what's recommended is that it's tucked away and hidden. Um, I, for the longest time, um, had all of my credit cards cut up and I wasn't using them at all. Um, I, in college, just got so used to utilizing it um, that I didn't even think about it. You know, I was just swiping away and then the bill would come and I'd be like, oh, whoa, wait. And then I had that habit inside of me. So I had to just get rid of them all together. And now um, I'll utilize it for some larger purchases and then just know that I have that money in my budget to pay for it. Um, but just to get those points or whatever, you know. <laughs> it, it's funny how quickly it adds up too. Like I've opened a credit card bill and been like, oh, this is going to be a great month because I didn't make any large purchases. And it's like, two dollars for coffee like who charges coffee apparently i did that month and like it all adds up and you know the bottom line grows really quickly when you're not being mindful about what you're swiping yeah exactly and it's so easy like you said to just oh just hand it over and then you don't even think about it right because it was two dollars and then you're like oh two dollars x amount of times uh -huh. <laughs> over the course of the month uh can be a little jarring when you open that bill. Yeah. So someone who's um, going through a divorce, often money is one of the biggest stressors and the biggest reason why they're anxious. And especially if they're not the ones who have paid the bills or handled it, or just the, the prospect of now they have a reduced income because the incomes are halved in two houses. 
What's right. the first step that someone should take in order to really get a handle on their money and their budgeting and debt? Sure. Uh, and I just want to step back for a moment. Um, I've read some articles that talk about money is normally something that one person in the household takes care of. Mm-hmm. And we experienced that in my household where I was doing that. I was the one who's just taking care of the money. And then my husband would say, oh yeah, blah, blah, blah. I need to purchase this. And I'm like, can't, sorry, you know? <laughs> and then he's like, well, wait, what, what, what? Like, and so it really takes sitting down a monthly meeting, right? It's a monthly money meeting and talking through what goes into the finances. And even if you don't want to take your finances over and you don't want to be the one to pay the bills, I get that, but there has to be some sort of eye on what's going on. So that way, when you get to that point where you either need to take over your own or you're going through a divorce and you're going to be doing that, it's not just a, where do I start? right? You never want to be at just a clean slate. So that would be my first recommendation is to have a monthly meeting. So everybody can get together and talk about, you know, there are things like, oh yeah, I have this coming up or this wedding is coming up or whatever. So that way you as a family can decide where the money is is going to go um, for that month. And then secondly, and in the situation of someone who's going through a divorce and kind of like, where do they get started? I would recommend working with a financial, either like a budget consultant such as myself or a financial advisor and just sitting down and seeing the picture of your money. Now, if that's something that they can handle and they think that that's, you know, on their own, great. Um, But sometimes it's nice to just have another person's eyes on it and to have that reassurance that it can be done we can get you set up with a budget. We can get you, um, you know, set up with a path forward. So that way you don't feel like you're alone in that process. Mm. And so what's the difference between a budget consultant and a financial Mm. advisor or even an accountant? Sure. Yeah. That's a great question. So a financial advisor or a financial planner, they typically are involved in every realm of saving, um, investments, retirement, that type of thing. So really knowing more about the stock market and where to put your money. I, on the other hand, as a budget consultant, I can help you take a look at the money that you have and then how to budget for success. But then I'm not, I'm not the expert in the stock market and how to place your money in Roth IRAs or not, you know, so I, I have a financial planner that I go to, to help me with that piece of the puzzle. Oh, so, so that's great. So it's almost, it's like really like a team effort. Totally. <laughs> you know, you're helping with like the day to day and the the coffee fund and the financial yep. advisors helping with the long term and retirement. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you plan for expenses that you don't even know you have yet that come up, you know, out of the blue? There's kids expenses, there's emergency expenses, whatever it is. Yes, that is a great question. So we have two different emergency funds in our house. So one is cash, $1,000, and that's for if a furnace needs repaired or um, something happens and, you know, it's, it's kind of out of the blue, then we have that money there as a backup. And then we have a second emergency fund, which is um, a larger fund. There's $15,000 in that, and we utilize that in those larger scenarios, or it's also there if one of us were to lose a job. So, you know, it's very important, especially during these times with the pandemic, uh, as a sign language interpreter, um, the work has gone to almost none. Um, So that's money there as a backup. So I recommend both the $1,000 cash to have available for smaller emergencies, and then secondarily have another in a bank account. And it's typically three to six months worth of your expenses is the guideline to have stashed away. And this is like sacred money. Like you're not dipping in here to go buy those new shoes that you want. Like you don't touch it, right? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. It's called the need or want test, right? Mm -hmm. So if you have something and you're ready to like hit submit, um, I don't know if you 
Mel Robbins. Do you know who that is or do you oh, follow yeah. her at all? Mm -hmm. So she has the five second rule that she utilizes to motivate her to do things. And I use it in that aspect also, but I also use it in the reverse. Like if I'm ready to hit submit, I'll go five, four, three, two, one, need or want. And then it just like helps your brain go like, okay, right. I bought a pair of sandals because I needed a pair of sandals for the summer. I, I didn't have any, uh, but I already have one. Second pair becomes a want, you know? Mm. So it just gives you a second to analyze uh, needs versus wants. And, and it, that, yeah. that's great. And, and, you know, I like to go shopping for my couch and put it all in the cart. And then I let it sit for a night. And then I go back the next day. And I'm like, do, now do I really have to have this? And usually I don't. Like yeah. nine out of 10 times I'm deleting everything from the car. <laughs> yes, exactly. And that's a great way to do it too. I'm sure the, uh, the store where you're shopping doesn't <laughs> I know, but <laughs> doesn't appreciate that, but it's not about them, right? It's, it's about you being able to go back and <laughs> right. But then those shoes like haunt me for the next couple of weeks. Cause it shows up on all my feeds. They're like, Hey, <laughs> you like me. I saw you wanted those. <laughs> They're like, want, want. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, and then that's the deal. Then for next month, if you put money aside for those shoes, then you get to buy them without the remorse, right? Mm. You're like, I put those in the budget. I planned wow. for those. And, and now those shoes get to be mine. So. Mm. so you brought up something that I think is so important and so worth talking about is having conversations with your partner. So that could be a spouse, a new spouse, a new relationship that you're living together, whatever it is, because that's sometimes such an uncomfortable conversation to have, but it's like mm -hmm. sitting down and having that so that everyone is on the same page. I think that's so important. Yeah, it, it's the number one way to really get comfortable with each other's finances. And it was when my fiance now my husband, but when he was my fiance at the time, when I said like, Hey, I want to sit down and talk about money. He, he kind of gave me this strange look. And I, I really talked to him about the philosophy that I follow and the zero budgeting. And, and I was like, do you mind if I just start doing that for us now? So, you know, cause we were trying to pay for the wedding and, and all that. And he was totally on board, but you have to find a middle ground, right? Like where are you going to meet if, if one person's a big spender and one person's a big saver, or if one person has goals of X, Y, and Z, and the other person isn't on board with that, um, money can be a, a definite cause of contention. And so mm -hmm. the, the sooner you can just get it out on the table and whether that's, you know, one person's writing it down and the other person's writing it down and you swap papers or whatever that looks like, but just and, beginning to have that conversation. And what's so important about that is that often in second marriages or beyond, we're coming to the table a little bit older and we've been handling our own. So when I got married to my current husband, it was like, I had been on my own. I've been paying my own bills and he had been doing the same. So we both kind of came independently and for a little while. We stayed independent of that. And then it was like, all right, I do things this way. He does it that way. But at some point we had to come to the table and kind of share, you know, all of that. And yeah. I think that that was probably a stressor for a little bit because it was like, we were each kind of like hiding our paper, you know, like, yeah, <laughs> I'm not going to show you what I have over here, but you know, it's, it's once you have those conversations and put them out there, then you can just be honest about it and, and really be united. Yeah. And, and like you said, it, it may not have been a stressor in the forefront mm -hmm. of your mind, but it still was like lingering back there, you know, and, and I couldn't have said it more perfectly, but to be able to be united in how you're going to handle money is, is key. So what about debt consolidation? So sometimes mm -hmm. if some people go to the store and not me, of course, but they open like, you know, every card possible because you get your 10%, 15%. At some point, does it make sense to consolidate everything into one card that has a lower interest rate? Yeah, that's a great question. So depending on where you're consolidating, there are some companies who offer consolidation that 
they're making money off of it, right? If they're going to sell a product, they're going to make making money off it. So you really have to read through the fine print carefully. Uh, I don't typically recommend those type of entities, but um, if for say there's a credit card that has 0% interest for X amount of months mm -hmm. and you know that you could pay off three of your other ones within that time frame, don't just consolidate it to then consolidate it and then later that 24% interest is going right. to hit you, but do the numbers and make sure, okay, if I open this 0%, I'll put X amount there and I know I can have that paid off in six months. Sure. Great. You can go for that, but don't do it without that planning ahead of time, knowing how long it would take you to to get rid of that expense. Right. Because usually at the other end, when it runs up, you get hit, right? Some exactly. of them go all the way back to the number of months. Exactly. I mean, that's what they, they depend on. They want people not to pay them off. Exactly. It, it looks like such a great offer and it's tempting. And like you said, that's, they're expecting people to either, oh, I didn't know when the six months was up or I thought I could get rid of it in, in six months, but I can't. And um, that's how they make right. their money. So we just have to outsmart them. That's <laughs> perfect. So we can do that. Totally. <laughs> um, and if your income is variable like yours is, do you have any um, special tips for that situation when your paycheck week to week does, doesn't always look the same? Yeah, great question. I have two tips. Um, I'll start with how I started my budget. Um, if you take a look over the last 12 months and say, how much am I earning? and divide that by 12, then you get a rough idea. Now, some people may not have a full 12 months, we'll look at six. If you don't have a full six, look at three and just start somewhere to see, okay, what am I normally earning? And then if you have a month where you earn more than that, don't make that your income for the month, put that into savings and stick to what you normally earn. So that way, when you have a dip, you can just grab that extra that you made from the month before and put it on top and there it looks like you're making that same amount, right? So you don't want to get yourself caught in, oh, I'm in a low month and now I don't have enough money to pay for the expenses that I have. So that's tip number one is on the months that you make an excess, store that away into savings. Tip number two, and this is a little bit harder to get to, but after I got rid of all of my debt, we then started saving. So that way I pay everything that, what I do is I take everything that I earned. So let's say I earned it in May. That's what I know I have to spend in June. Mm -hmm. So I don't just take the money as it comes. I put it into my account and then I know exactly how much I have in my budget for that following month. So it's called the one month ahead philosophy. And that is what I have been using for the last 10 or so years. Um, and that has kind of changed the game for me because now there is no variable. I already know exactly what I'm going to be working with. Ah, okay. So no surprises. Yeah, that's the thing. I am somebody who 100% loves surprises, but when it comes to money, not even a one cent surprise. <laughs> I'm pretty strict on no surprises with money. <laughs> and so how does someone work with a budgeting consultant? Like if someone came to you, what would you, how does that process look? Yeah. And it can be a variety of things. I've, I've had some people who say, I have a budget already. I just want you to review it with me. Great. So we'll sit down and we'll kind of talk through things. I'll give pointers. Um, I'll affirm when, when things are looking good or, that type of thing. So just an extra set of eyes on your budget, everything from that to entire budget creation. There's some people who have never used a budget before, don't know how, and we'll start with inventory, all of your spending, like I mentioned previously, and then we'll go to crafting a budget, and then we'll sit down and we'll revise it together. And we can do that one time, we can do that on a monthly basis, I can set up the Excel spreadsheet for you with all the formulas in it. Uh, it's really kind of a choose your own adventure on how much involvement you'd like a, an advisor or a consultant to have. 
And do you hand out the envelopes? Like all the <laughs> No, but that's a great product idea. So I'll <laughs> you have to brand it. it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then lastly, how does someone reach out to you if they want to work with you or find more information or um, just follow you on social media? My website is Melissa Mitt, and that's just M I T T dot com. So Melissa Mitt dot com. Middlestat is my last name, and that's too much. So <laughs> <laughs> we shortened it to Melissa Mitt. And then on Facebook, I'm financially I N D E P. So you can find me there. All right. And everything will be in the show notes as well. Thank you so much for sharing your own personal journey and also your professional expertise in this area. Um, it's such an important topic and it's so important to start talking about it and strip away the shame. So thank you for taking the time to be here. Absolutely. Appreciate you having me. All right. Bye. Bye. All right. Awesome. Well, cool. oops, I guess I'm.